Right, so good evening everyone. Uh, thank you very much indeed to Vindalanda and to the team there for inviting me to do this evening's lecture. Uh, it's a great honour and a great privilege to both be doing this and also to be doing the event uh, later on uh, this month as part of the Hadrian's Wall 1900th anniversary celebrations. So uh, looking forward to both. Um, so as Penny said in the background, um, I am a retired consultant in emergency medicine, uh, retired just at the back end of last year, and I'm thoroughly enjoying all of the benefits of retirement, I have to say. Um, other elements of my background, as she hinted at, I've got a lifetime interest in the history of medicine and in particular uh, Roman and medieval medicine, especially. Um, I'm also a very keen traveler, probably coming out of my time in the military uh, as a naval doctor. And in particular, I'm fascinated by the anthropological and ethnographic aspects of, of travel and, and how that links with past histories as well. Uh, so, so that's my background. Um, I will say that during the course of the lecture this evening, I will be discussing some medical procedures in, um, in, in detail. I don't have any gory medical slides that I'm going to show you. Uh, sorry about that if you were expecting that, uh, but I will be talking quite a bit of medical and surgical detail at one or two points during the lecture. So um, I, I hope that doesn't uh, cause anyone any distress. Uh, if it does just uh, tune out for a moment and I promise I won't dwell on the gory bits for too long. Um, in addition to my clinical practice, I'm a reenactor. Um, this is last year, I actually walked all of the remaining sections of Hadrian's Wall uh, in, in full Roman kit uh, as part of a fundraising drive, but it was actually a great interactive event as well, being able to interact with the public on Hadrian's Wall, particularly as we were coming out of lockdown and things, was a, a very special time. So I do have a couple of conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, obviously, I am a reenactor. I'm a member of the uh, Roman Military Research Society, also known as the 14th Legion. And independently, I'm a costumed interpreter uh, and I, I work independently as uh, Marcus the Medicus doing work for museums, schools, and so on. Before we get into the presentation, I, I do have to just make a little note about some of the images that I'm using this evening. Um, at the time that I put this presentation together, all of the images were available under a Creative Commons license or with a specific license for use for educational purposes, which obviously uh, this counts as. Um, but some of the organisations have asked me to give a particular note of thanks to them for the ability to use the images in the presentation and I have listed all of the organisations here and as we go through credits will appear at the bottom of the relevant slides so a specific thank you to all of those institutions for allowing me to use their images as, as part of this evening's presentation. So a good place to start is Vindalanda and I thought it would be sensible if we reviewed what evidence we have for medical practices from Vindolanda. I'm assuming that many of you have visited both the site and the museum there. So you will know that in the museum, there are a number of jars and also instruments which could have been used as either part of medical treatment, preparation of a, a medicine, administration of a medicine or perhaps as part of cosmetics and unguents and so on. So clearly there are some finds that certainly do have a medical bias in terms of what their use was. In terms of direct evidence of medical practice at Vindolanda, we get a number of references in the tablets and I'm just going to talk you through those because they give us a few interesting insights and also pose some thoughts and some challenges to us. So of the tablets that mention medical matters, one is tablet 294, which is known as the fever cure tablet. And in translation, this makes a reference to somebody bringing remedies with them when going to visit a friend. So I shall bring you two remedies, the one for, 
and tantalizingly we don't know what it was for and the other for a fever so this gives us some insight as to how people went about treating everyday maladies and it kind of hints at the fact that perhaps people self-medicated a lot of the time and in many ways regarded home prepared remedies or perhaps purchased remedies as being the first go-to point of, of treating the majority of maladies that they, they, they suffered from. And that kind of fits with what people do today in terms of the way that we use boots or our local pharmacy or whatever. Perhaps the more famous medical reference comes from the strength report tablet, which is number 154, which gives us a detailed account of the strength of the first cohort of Tungrians. And out of 296 active duty members present, there was a sick roll of 15 off sick, of whom six were wounded. And in addition, there were 10 that were unfit for duty as a result of inflammation of the eyes. So this suggests that certainly at that point in time, there was a problem with an infectious conjunctivitis or something similar affecting the first, first cohort of the Tungrians. And I'll come back and I'll talk a little bit about eye disease later on and perhaps give a couple of suggestions as to why the Tungrians were suffering from conjunctivitis. Two other tablets which have oblique references to medical practice are tablets 586 and 156, which give us a couple of individuals' names. We know that there was a pharmacist called Vitalis, and we know that Marcus was the medical orderly. There is an overlap in the time period of the tablet, so it's entirely possible that these two individuals were at Vindolanda at the same time as each other but we don't have absolute proof for that. But one would suspect that perhaps they were. And if we have both a pharmacist and a medical orderly, it would hint at the fact that the Tungrian cohort had some sort of in-fort medical facility, whether it was a full valetudinarium, a hospital, or whether it was something smaller, we don't know. And obviously we don't have the archeological evidence to answer that question for us. But what we do know is that the aforementioned Marcus went with a group of 30 builders to build the residence. And the implication is that this was somehow a residence for which Marcus was responsible. And therefore, by deduction, we can perhaps assume that this was some sort of facility for Marcus to care for the sick and the injured in. And that's a broad deduction, but it would seem to make sense and it would fit with what we know about the way that Roman forts were laid out. There was a fairly standard layout of the main buildings, including a medical facility. Obviously, in the current excavations, there has been no conclusive evidence of a hospital facility being found at Vindolanda. And the explanation for that may be that in the later forts, actually there wasn't as much need for a valetudinarium because clearly by that stage, Housteads had been established up the road and we do know that Housteads had quite a large valetudinarium and given the close geographic proximity of the two forts, it is entirely possible that perhaps medical care was devolved more to the adjacent fort up the road and any medical facility in, in the later versions of Vindolanda was perhaps something a bit smaller and, and maybe based around uh, just a medical orderly calling on resources from the larger fort up the road. We don't know for sure and obviously as excavations continue we may get a nice surprise and it would delight me if we could find a hospital within Vindolanda and if we do I look forward to coming back and doing a lecture for you in the future about it when we have the archaeological evidence that we can refer to. So that, that's what we have from Vindolanda, and, and, and clearly I can't make a, a full talk for the evening uh, out of that evidence. So what I'm going to do is now move on and look at the topic of medicine, health and healthcare in the Roman Empire in a much broader way. 
And before I do that, I want to just give you a little timeline because I think it's very easy to lump bits of Roman history together and sort of assume that they were all contemporaneous with each other. And when we're thinking about the development of medical practice, that is a very false thing to do. So I've done this little timeline showing clearly the, um, the history of the, the Roman Empire over on the left hand side of your screen from um, the foundation of Rome, clearly Julius Caesar, the invasion of Britannia, the construction of Hadrian's Wall, Septimius Severus and Constantine, just to give a couple of sort of visual reference points down that axis. And then I've included pictures of the people that I'm going to talk about in detail as we go through the presentation this evening. So Hippocrates, Celsus, Dioscorides and Galen. And I've put a couple in blue who are famous authors fitting them into the timeline as well. I'm sorry they don't uh, actually get uh, an image. I was running out of space on the slide. And I've also included alongside the timeline approximately when the Vindolanda tablets date from and, and when the fort that we now see at Vindolanda dates from just to give you a perspective. So hopefully that is useful and if I can just get you to sort of hold that in your mind as we go through I hope it will understand what I'm trying to bring, bring out about the development of uh, medical practices during the Roman Empire. So the topics that I'm going to cover are built around the topics that we're going to have as uh, banners and display items in the event that's happening uh, at the end of this month. And broadly, I'm going to talk about Roman thoughts about disease and cures, what causes disease, how cures work, and their thoughts about doctors as well, uh, before moving on to talk about some specific aspects of, of Roman medical practice, um, how doctors went about curing diseases, the, the role of plant remedies, and I'm going to talk about surgery as well. And then we'll move on and think a little bit about healthcare in the Roman army specifically, and perhaps think about how that maybe drove the development of in particular surgical practice uh, during the Roman Empire. And then to draw the evening to a close, I want to just think a little bit about origins and influences. Where did Roman medicine come from? And importantly, what did it contribute? How does it fit into the overall pattern of developing medical practice right across the world? Uh, so that will bring us to a conclusion, hopefully in about 30 minutes time. So let's start off by thinking about how Romans perceived that they needed to act to stay fit and healthy. So as Rome expanded and as urbanisation around the empire increased, very rapidly it was appreciated that public health measures were essential to bring benefits for the population. And if you ignored the need for public health measures, then you would pay the price in terms of disease, loss of life, and so on. And we all know that the Romans put very great store by having good water supplies into their cities to provide drinking water, water for the baths, fountains, and so on. And, and clearly they were expert engineers in terms of being able to get water across vast distances, but also to distribute that water effectively around their cities. Alongside that was the recognition that you needed to use that water to guarantee the removal of effluent and waste from the increasing populations. So the construction of public latrines around the city is something that we recognise as one of the really important public health measures that they took. And obviously in Rome itself, the main sewer, the Cloaca Maxima, was an absolutely enormous construction and it was a key part of actually keeping at least the main central sections of the city clear of waste. It wasn't up to coping with the waste that accumulated in the slum districts and the poorer areas, but uh, it, it did a pretty good job at keeping the main part of, of central Rome relatively waste free. Alongside that, the public baths were perceived as being essential to the maintenance of health and well-being 
by the Romans. So the regular visiting of the baths, both for washing, but also the exercise that went along with the bathing routine was seen as being a key contributor to the maintenance of, of good health. Exercise often took place before using the baths in the adjacent exercise facilities that were built in the vast majority of, of public bathhouses. And we see depictions of the participation in exercise in a large number of frescoes, mosaics, and so on from around the Roman Empire. The Romans also recognized that it was important to eat a varied diet and that by doing that, one had health benefits. And there are lots of references in the written Roman literature about the benefits of sensible eating, balanced eating, and the way to mix a range of ingredients together for the health benefits that that gave you, as well as for the interest value of the food that you were eating. So, so they recognised that having a broad based diet that included different sources of protein, different fruits, different vegetables, they recognised that as being important. And of course, one of the things that we can thank the Romans for here in Britain is some of the range of fruits and vegetables that we now have in this country, which very definitely have their origins in having been imported by the Romans as, as part of their occupation of Britannia. When it comes to the Roman army, uh, the Roman army recognised that cabbage was one of the essentials for staying fit and healthy. And uh, there are a large number of references to the need for soldiers to eat large quantities of, of cabbage because of the health benefits that it brought. So what about the prevailing thoughts on what caused disease and the way that cures worked? Well, we know from a whole range of early Roman authors that they had observed the patterns of illness and death and had deduced that in cities especially, those patterns of illness were associated with bad air, bad water, the presence of swamps, the presence of sewage and other urban detritus and a lack of personal cleanliness. And, and some went into more specific detail. So thinking about swamps, Marcus Varro wrote that certain tiny creatures which cannot be seen by the eyes breed there, meaning in the swamps. They float through the air and enter the body by the nose and the mouth and cause serious disease. That's a really very insightful statement, considering it was written more than 2000 years ago. And it suggests that he was really considering the possibility that microorganisms, which we now obviously recognize following the invention of the microscope as being bacteria, viruses and parasites and so on. He recognized that there was the potential and obviously the obvious scientific indicators that these things were present and were leading to the formation of disease. And actually, some of his writings were used by Caesar in draining some of the swamps around Rome, which had a direct effect in terms of reducing the incidence of malaria in the area at the time. So it, it's clear that writers like Varro, and then later on Pliny, had these very strong sensible ideas about what caused disease and why, and they came up with hypotheses that would suggest why they thought was the case. And that was then used to inform decisions that were made to try and improve public health by civic authorities and so on. Marcus Varro also tells us and gives us advice about how to choose a good location for a farm building. So he tells us that when you are planning to build a farm in the countryside, you should take a special care to place the farm at the foot of a wooded hill where it's exposed to health giving winds. This is going back to that idea that bad air and bad water are propagators of, of disease, that they are malign influences. And if we look at a fairly typical layout of a Roman farm and a Roman farmstead, we will see that Marcus Varro's advice was, was fairly widely accepted as being a sensible way to go about constructing your, your, your farming um, area. 
In terms of common ailments, we have a large number of references. Probably one of the best is from Celsus talking about how to treat a coryza. So a, a, a coryza is basically the common cold and doctors today still use the term coryzal symptoms to describe the runny nose that you get in the early part of developing the common cold. So Celsus says that early on in the time course of a coryza, you should stay out of the sun, you should avoid any hot baths or sexual intercourse or wine, but walking was good. Once the phlegm in the nose has reduced, then you were allowed to go back to having hot baths and you could also eat more and take wine. So he gives us a very specific prescription and actually reading in more detail, because I've just taken a few bullet points as quotations from Celsus, he recognises that the average coryza is going to be something that lasts before between five and seven days, because he gives a time scale for when you ought to be following the various elements of his advice. I think it's fair to say that the Romans didn't have a very good opinion of doctors. And perhaps that's in part because in the early days, certainly during the Republic and in the early days of the empire, the vast majority of doctors were actually Greek in origin. It wasn't considered a gainful profession by Romans and certainly by educated Romans, they wouldn't think about becoming doctors. It, it didn't form part of their trajectory of honourable jobs and experiences that they should be having to lead a fulfilled life and to get a post in, in, in the Senate. Um, so, so Pliny tells us when writing about doctors that only a doctor can kill a man with impunity. And uh, he goes on to uh, reference uh, in the form of hearsay uh, that a, a patient died from having too many doctors. Um, so I think it's, it, it's fairly clear that Romans really didn't think much of doctors um, and, and actually when they became ill, they would try and do everything to avoid going to see a doctor. They, they would use home remedies as, as step one. If that failed, they would then probably take the recourse to seek divine help. And you would only go and get a doctor involved in your healthcare when everything else had failed. And there are references in the Roman literature that would suggest that was very much the way that they thought about things. Which brings us on fairly neatly to the divine influence. So uh, the Romans we know were hugely superstitious. They had many amulets and charms that they wore at various points in their life. And they had various acts as routines that they would use to avert the evil eye. So, so we know that Roman children uh, would wear a, a, a bulla, and you can see both on the statue uh, and, and the bulla on the right hand side, examples of what that might look like. Um, we know that the phallic symbol was regularly worn around the neck and also used as an ornamentation in houses as a way of averting the evil eye. So, you know, it, it's clear that they perceived that if the evil eye touched you, then you would suffer misfortune and lots of the writings would suggest that the perceived misfortune is that you would become ill or blighted by, by some sort of affliction. It's also known that if you became ill and those simple home remedies didn't work, then the next port of call was you would seek divine intervention. So you would go and make offerings and pray to a relevant God. And there were a huge range of relevant gods. Obviously, Asclepius is regarded as being the god with responsibility for health, for cures and for doctors. And there were a number of shrines to him right across the empire. And we believe that Roman doctors and, and healthcare practitioners very much regarded Asclepius as being their patron god, that they would offer prayers to him to actually do good treatments and to make their patients better. So doctors also included invoking the benevolence of, of the gods as part of their treatment regime 
for patients. And, and we find multiple representations of Asclepius with his staff and his serpent, often with one of his daughters. So Hygieia or Panacea, amongst others. And I will come back and reference them towards the end. If one went to a temple to seek divine intervention for one's healthcare needs, then one would probably leave some sort of votive offering. And this votive offering would indicate the area of the body that was troubled. So in this case, obviously an eye, this was found in Roxeter. And slightly more debatable is this object, which has been likened to being a uterus. And some people have suggested that it could be a votive offering seeking for assistance in conception. Equally, it has been suggested that it could be something a little bit more general than that, and this could be a representation of some generalised internal organ. So there's, there's a big debate and there's a lovely scientific paper on the topic entitled When is a Womb Not a Womb that you can look up if you want to know more about this particular votive. We also know that in Romano-British culture, there was a blending of Roman ideas and local traditions, and people would make offerings to local gods or blended deities that had features of both a Roman god or goddess and a local god. And we see that in particular uh, in Bath, where the deity Aquisulis is a wonderful blend of Roman and, and British cultures. So let's move on and think a little bit about Roman medicine and curing disease. We know that often doctors worked alongside temple sites, so we perhaps have a concept of a health spa where you go to a temple, you also see a, a healer, and you have some sort of therapeutic stay that covers all your bases in one. Um, this is the Aesculapian in, in Pergamon, uh, and uh, sorry, in, in Pergamon, sorry which is now Bergama in Turkey, which is where Galen came from. Uh, that's where he grew up and clearly was exposed to medical practice as a youngster before moving to Rome. And, and we know Galen because he wrote extensively about his theories of causation of disease and treatment of diseases. And this is known as Galen's humoral theory. And he was basically elaborating on ideas that have been put forward by Hippocrates. So the idea that the body is made up out of earth, air, fire and water, and that you have a series of humours that become evident if that balance between the four essential elements becomes disturbed. And it recognises the fact that there are a number of things that will upset that balance, including the seasons of the year, the environmental conditions and also what you eat and what you drink. So as, as a quick demonstration of Galen's principles, let's look at the bottom left hand side of this diagram and, and, and look at the elements of air and water, two of those four essential elements of the body. If you are exposed to a wet and windy climate, then it's entirely likely that excesses of air and water will enter your body, will upset that natural balance. And the outcome of that is that you start developing the humour phlegm, a runny nose. So this is going back to Celsus's Coryza. So effectively what Galen is saying is if you stay out in the West in the cold without your coat, then you're going to get a, a, a cold, which I seem to remember my granny said to me on many occasions. Uh, perhaps flies slightly in the same face of Marcus Varro and his recognition of microorganisms, but you can see how the, the principle worked. And the treatments that were recognised as being relevant to use were medications that had the opposite features. So if you had your imbalance tipped in one direction, you had to tip it back in the diametrically opposite direction by taking medicines that had properties on the opposite side of the diagram. And by and large, those remedies were formed from, from plants. And we're very lucky in that a Roman author called Discorides was absolutely obsessed with recording plants from around the Roman Empire, where they came from, how they were used, their role in treating disease. And he also was, we believe, involved in 
at least advocating for the transplantation of plants to different areas of the empire so their properties could be um, uh, could be used in areas where they previously uh, didn't grow. And we have got copied writings from Discorides which are still available to us today and can be analysed in quite great detail. You'll notice that the examples that I've shown have got Arabic script on and I will come back and explain why that is the case uh, towards the end of this talk. We know that sometimes the desire to use the properties of a plant actually led to the plant becoming extinct. So there is a belief that the plant sylphium, which could be found on the Mediterranean shores of what we now think of as being Turkey, it was believed to be a contraceptive agent. And so great was the desire to get hold of this plant and to use it for that role that the plant uh, became extinct. Another plant that was recognised as being very much a cure-all was sage, and perhaps the prevalence of sage that we have around nowadays is in part due to the fact that the Romans regarded it as being one of the panaceas, and it was actually referred to as salvare, so a salvation, so a cure-all effectively. So I said I was going to come back and talk about eye disease. Um, it's clear that the Romans had quite a lot of problems with their eyes. There are lots of references in the literature and lots of finds of votives. And I've already shown you this votive that was found in, in Roxeter. Uh, and we believe that Roxeter was perhaps some sort of a centre for people to go to if they were experiencing eye problems. And perhaps there was a particular shrine there and the sort of treatment complex that I've already described with physicians that specialised in treating eye disease and carrying out eye operations that was uh, was based there. So we know that eye disease was a problem and we know that the Tungrians experienced problems with um, epidemics of some form of eye inflammation, probably conjunctivitis and probably an infectious conjunctivitis. And my thought is that perhaps this relates to the habit of, 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 of bathing. The water in the baths in Rome was certainly far from clean. We know they had this habit of cleansing the skin by pouring oil on and then using a strigil, as you can see in the illustration on this slide. And clearly that gloop of dirty oil and shed skin cells and so on would end up floating as a scum on the surface of the bath water. And you can imagine that that would be a very good vehicle for transmitting infection and, and leading to infectious conjunctivitis. So, so that's my thought as to why conjunctivitis was, was so prevalent. There are lots of illustrations of Roman eye cures, both in terms of statues and, and carvings that have been found from right across the Roman Empire. And we have also found a large number of oculists stamps. These are engraved stamps that were used to impress into a pre-prepared medication. And the medications that were used were formed into little tubs like this. This one was actually found in a shipwreck in the Mediterranean. And it is one of the few surviving examples that we have. And it's the only example of a genuine pre-prepared prescription from antiquity that we have in its original form, which makes it absolutely fascinating. And the stamps that the oculists used were impressed into the medication whilst it was still moist and then it dried into a firm substance, which we believe was then scraped and mixed with water to turn into an eye salve or an eye bath. And there's been quite a lot of analysis done on the contents of these prepared ophthalmic medications. And, and they include, amongst other things, zinc, which is quite a powerful anti-inflammatory medicine. Some of the other preparations also include some of the rarer earths and metals, which are quite strongly antibacterial as well. And a number of these have been tested in modern medical laboratories, looking for their efficacy against the sort of bacteria that would cause infective conjunctivitis, and they have been shown to be highly effective. One of the Roman authors that wrote quite extensively about the eye was Celsus, and he described the anatomy of the eye 
in his early writings in an awful lot of detail. He did actually believe that the eye served to actually produce light. And he said that the only way that we could see things was because the eye shone a light onto objects and that allowed us to actually see what was in front of us, which kind of fits with the statement about the light went out of his eyes, which is a Roman way of saying that somebody has died. Clearly, Celsus believed that if you formed a cataract in your eye, then the light would not be able to shine out and therefore you would not be able to see. Now, of course, we now understand that it's kind of the reverse. If you've got a cloudy lens, then you can't actually focus the image on your retina to be able to see things. Um, what Celsus recommended was the treatment was to do something known as couching. So you introduce a sharp needle through the front of the eye, passing through what we call the anterior chamber now, and you press against the lens in the direction shown by the arrow on this slide, which leads to the lens dislocating into the eye. And this would allow light to pass through the pupil. So you would actually go from being virtually blind to at least be able to perceive light and dark. So you would be able to go back to being independently mobile. You could walk around the forum without bumping into pillars and people and so on. So it, it was you know, definitely a procedure that brought some benefits. It was also recognized as being quite risky. And in general, patients only had one eye couch. They never did both at the same time, which is, is probably a recognition of the fact that it's slightly risky poking a sharp needle into the front of somebody's eye. We also know that the Emperor Nero used a eye glass in the form of a gemstone at the arena. We don't quite know why he did that. Was it because he had some of some sort of refractive abnormality with his eye? Was he using the gemstone as a way of focusing things or was he actually just using it as a bit of bling to basically protect his eyes against the sunlight glaring off the sand? And was it an example of a, an early um, emperor's sunglass? We don't know, but there is a reference to him using it. So let's think quickly about surgery. Um, we, we know that the Romans did surgery. We know that they had quite expansive collections of surgical instruments, and we have some illustrations of the type of procedures that they did. Now, as with some of the instruments that are in Vindolanda's collection, it's often quite difficult to work out what they were used for. W were they used for doing surgical procedures or did people use them to pluck out their nasal hairs and so on? And unless you have a context, it can be really quite difficult. And I guess you could say the same if you went into the average doctor's office nowadays, there are various items that you could take out and out of context, they could easily be just standard tools or indeed domestic items. So, so we do need a context when interpreting finds of instruments. Now, fortunately, Pompeii gave us that because the ashes of Vesuvius buried a complete collection of surgical instruments. And this gave us a fantastic reference set of what a set of surgical equipment would look like. And, and these images I'm using with the express permission of the University of Virginia and, and very grateful thanks to them because they are absolutely fantastic images of some of the best and, and, and most well-known Roman surgical instruments uh, anywhere in the world. So, so we have scal scalpels which are beautifully weighted. I've got a museum quality reproduction of one of these, uh, which is actually uh, the second one down on the slide labelled B. And what's fascinating about this is you have the sharp end to the left, which is clearly the cutting end. And then you have the blunt end to the right, which is a blunt dissector. And if you want to actually make an incision into the body, you cut through the skin. But once you're through the skin, you try and dissect by using the natural tissue planes of the body. So you don't cut through muscle because it will bleed if you do. You try and find the fascial layers, the planes that separate the muscles and try and move them apart. And this wonderful instrument is beautifully balanced and does both of those jobs for you. So it, it, it really is a, a specific purpose design tool to do a surgeon's work. Uh, so a fantastic example. The same collection had surgical scissors, probes, and forceps within it. And given the context, we know that these were medical forceps. There were devices that we believed to be quarteries that could be heated and used 
to staunch blood flow. And then there's a wonderful collection of orthopedic instruments. So bone levers, osteotomes and bone forceps, which are remarkably similar to the tools that would be used in a trauma set nowadays as part of managing compound fractures. We have something that is very readily recognisable as being a male catheter. And interestingly, both the angle of curvature and the size of this particular instrument is almost identical to a device that we would now use in a patient that had a very difficult prostate to pass a catheter through. We have rigid catheters that we use for patients that go into retention of urine, and it looks almost identically the same nowadays as to this Roman device. We know that the Romans uh, were quite fond of administering enemas, and they had a range of different clisters that they used to do that, a fairly horrifying prospect. And then the slight challenge of the uvula forcep. Uvula forceps have been found right across the Roman Empire. Now, the uvula is that dangly bit of tissue at the back of your soft palate. And the question is really why the Romans thought they needed an instrument to remove it and why they thought it was a good idea to do that. Nowadays, we tend to only operate on the uvula as part of a fairly complex procedure on the soft palate to deal with persistent snoring or with obstructive sleep apnea. We do know that very definitely the instrument was used in this way because we actually have a specific bit of writing that tells us that it could be used for clamping or in patients where they were afraid of the knife or where there was a risk of hemorrhage, you could use the same device to apply a caustic and burn the uvula away. So is there a context for that? Well, yes, I believe there is, because ethnographically, if you look in West Africa especially, it's quite common practice for traditional healers to actually remove the uvula to prevent infections and other disorders associated with the throat. So perhaps it could be seen as an alternative to tonsillectomy, for example. And we only have to look back into our own medical past. So if you go back into the 1940s, 50s and 60s, the rate of tonsillectomy in childhood was much greater then than it is now. And many of those procedures were done unnecessarily. But we believed wrongly at that time that it was the right thing to do for children that had recurrent sore throats. So we even had children's literature written about the fact that you were going to say goodbye to your tonsils and it was normalised within society. So we can see how removal of the uvula could have been normalised in Roman society. And you can say the same for the process of bloodletting. This obviously fits in with Galen's theories about the humours being produced in excess as a result of shifts in the balance of your uh, essential elements and, and clearly one of the humours is blood. So the letting of blood fits with Galen's theory on the balance of the elements within the body. Lots of instruments have been found that are believed to be obstetric in nature. So we have vaginal speculums and we have things that have been identified as being obstetric hooks. And we know that the caesarean operation is a operation that was performed. My, my belief is that caesareans were really only performed when the mother was in the last stages of collapse. So in extremis and the expectation is that the mother would not survive the procedure but you might if you were lucky get a live child and this is something that unfortunately we still have to do occasionally nowadays if in the very advanced stages of pregnancy a mother suffers a cardiac arrest we know that the probability of being able to resuscitate her is really quite low and at that point when we're starting resuscitative efforts we also will take the decision to do a perimortem caesarean section as a way of trying to at least save one of the lives. And it does actually make it easier to carry out your resuscitative attempts on the mother as well. So sometimes we get a, 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 a double success, but more often one manages to save the child. And my belief is that the caesarean section that the Romans would have done would have been the same sort of operation. We do have other sets of surgical instruments that have been found. So this is one that was found in Britain. And fascinatingly, this dates to very early on 
in the Roman occupation of Britannia. And it suggests that perhaps Roman skills had been passing across the channel into Britannia before the Romans arrived, or perhaps it represents the fact that a clinician with the invading force decided to take his retirement and settle down and do some medical practice uh, in his new property in the newly conquered territories of Britannia. Obviously, we don't know for certain, but we've got a fantastic example of a surgical set from Britannia. You'll be pleased to know that with all of this surgery being carried out, there was an aesthetic potential. So the Romans used anaesthetics which were largely made up out of opiates. So the opium poppy, the resin that comes from it can be prepared into a medication. And we know that was stored and transported in flasks that look like this, which actually resemble the head of the poppy. And we believe that the opium was mixed with a number of other ingredients, probably alcohol in the form of wine, and then small quantities of other plant remedies, including perhaps mandrake or maybe henbane or hemlock. And if we actually look at the properties of those things, the, the opiate is clearly a strong painkiller. It's like morphine that we use nowadays as an analgesic. The alcohol is sedative in, in nature and the highly toxic elements of the henbane, the hemlock or the mandrake taken in small quantities are hallucinogenic. So you've got a mix which is sedative, pain relieving and also dissociative. And that absolutely parallels the set of medications that I would use in a trauma room. If you come in with a fracture dislocation of an ankle from a road traffic accident, I will use a combination of modern drugs that effectively do exactly the same th thing. It's a pain reliever, a sedative and a dissociator to allow me to actually treat the injury that you've got. So the, the Romans were using a very sensible combination of medicines there. They were also very sensible when it came to wound care. We, we know that they recognised the benefits of using vinegar to wash wounds with, and uh, that, that clearly is a antiseptic. We know that they boiled their instruments and, and cleaned them before reusing them. We don't quite know how they arrived at the point of recognising that that was a sensible thing to do, but we know that they did it. We also know that they had a number of advanced wound management techniques that they used. They, they used um, fibulae uh, as a way of holding a wound open to allow it to heal by slow granulation so that any evil humours within could escape, again, a writing from Celsus, and they used honey as one of the treatments for difficult to heal wounds. A later find of surgical instruments from the Roman Empire came from Rimini, uh, again the house being known as the house of the surgeon, and in this particular instance the assemblage of instruments would suggest that this particular surgeon from the third century had been a military surgeon before retiring and specialising in ophthalmic or eye surgery. So there is a hint both from this set of finds and also from writings around the empire that Roman surgical practice in the military was regarded as being of high quality. And actually doctors that had been with the military and in particular surgeons that had been with the military gained a status from having done that and settled down into quite lucrative practices in the provinces and in, in the towns of, of the empire, having learnt their trade uh, in the army, which brings us on into health or to healthcare in the army. So we know that Augustus reformed the way the um, Roman army was set up, and part of that reformation included improving medical services. And we believe that Augustus actually established a training school for um, medical personnel in in Rome. We know that the legions and the auxiliaries had within their ranks, capsarii, effectively field first aiders or bandages that were trained to actually respond and to control blood loss on the battlefield. And this is a very modern concept. It's the way we have actually improved survival in modern combat, for example, in Afghanistan, is immediate control of hemorrhage on the battlefield to allow the patient to be removed from the battlefield to have more definitive surgery at a later time. So it's a very modern concept. 
We know that they built hospitals in association with their forts. I've already alluded to that. And these hospitals were laid out on a fairly standard format. This is an example of a legionary hospital of Alitudinarium from the Rhine. I want to just talk a little bit about the medical aspects of selection of recruits for the Roman army. So we have a wonderful text that tells us what one should look for when identifying the medical attributes that are desirable in a recruit to the military. Uh, so in particular, the soldiers should be examined to look for features of their faces, their eyes, the make of their limbs, and to enable the selection team to make a sound judgment based upon those characteristics. And the same writing goes on to give us more detail about exactly what the positive attributes were. So the prospective soldier should have a lively eye, should carry his head erect, his chest should be broad, his shoulders muscular and brawny, his fingers long, his arms strong, his waist small, and his shape easy. So, you know, this hints at a fairly thorough physical examination as part of selection of recruits into the Roman army. And we know that once in the army and in training and in service, soldiers were given a very good diet by and large. And it's been estimated that on average, they were having about 3000 calories a day with a fairly significant contribution of carbohydrates. So this is actually the sort of type of diet that might be fed to a sportsman nowadays. So a high energy carbohydrate biased with a good representation of, of protein. It's what you would want an athlete to be consuming. So just to draw the session to a close, I want to think about origins and influences. So obviously the development of Roman medicine was heavily influenced by the ancient cultures that had preceded Rome. So Egypt had a long history of both medical and surgical practice, and there's good evidence for that. We've already mentioned the role of Greek physicians in the development of Roman medical practice, and we've made reference to Hippocrates and, and his writings. But one that is not so commonly recognized in terms of influencing the development of Roman medical practice is India. And we know that India established very significant trade links, or perhaps I should say Rome established the trade links with India. Once Rome had occupied Egypt, it got access to the Red Sea. And with that, it got access to the trade routes in the Indian Ocean. And we know that by the end of the first century AD, a significant percentage of the gross domestic product of Rome was being spent on the Indian subcontinent to purchase spices, amongst other things. But alongside that trade, there was very clearly a cultural exchange as well. And there are a number of examples that prove that that was happening. I want to put forward a theory that I think that some aspects of medical practice spread from India. So Shishruta, who lived and practiced in the ancient city of Benares, wrote a very detailed set of medical texts, including fantastic detail on how to manage various sorts of wound. And he went into a great deal of detail about what surgical treatments should be employed. He is also recognized as having developed a technique for doing a plastic surgical reconstruction. And in his writings, he details how one can replace a nose that has been amputated by taking what we would now think of as being a free vascular pedicle graft from the cheek and swinging it across to replace the tissue where the nose had been before it was amputated. This is a really advanced technique and we know that it was carried out and we know how it was carried out because we have the writings. We know that after the trade with India developed, this technique starts being used in Rome. So we have accounts of Roman surgeons operating on slaves who have been given their freedom to remove the brands that they had associated with their slavery. And we also know 
that in the period when there was persecution of the Jews, that the procedure of decircumcision was done to actually replace the foreskin onto the penis. And that can only be achieved by doing a free vascular pedicle graft in the way that Shishruta describes. Now, interestingly, that sort of surgical technique was not one that could have come from either Greece or from Egypt on the basis of the writings and the evidence that we have. And it forms a very strong suggestion that medical ideas were coming into Rome from India as well. So that brings us on to the influences. So as the Roman Empire slowly collapsed, we get a new developing powerhouse in the Middle East, which of course is the Islamic Empire. And we get a very rapid expansion of Islam out of the Middle East. And as part of that expansion, they occupied the big centers of learning like Damascus, like Alexandria, and they took the learning from the libraries that they conquered back to Baghdad, where the writings were translated into Arabic in an institution that was called the House of Wisdom. And this big infusion of acquired scientific knowledge from Rome, from Egypt, from Greece, allowed the development of Islamic science around the turn of the first millennium. And medically, we see Avicenna, or Ibn Sina, as he is known, coming out of that and benefiting from these writings that had been acquired by the Islamic invasion. And he is regarded in many ways as the founding father of modern medicine and wrote some very sensible statements about what medical practice is all about. Certainly, Avicenna's writings and other authors like him drove the development of medicine and pharmaceutical practice in the Middle East. And once the Crusades had come to an end, those influences spread from the Islamic world into Europe and fueled the European medical renaissance with the acquisition of those skills being integrated into pharmaceutical and medical practice right across Europe. And many of the surgical techniques that were commonplace in the Arabic world only became part of European medical practice again after the end of the Crusades. We also see the development of the medieval hospital in Europe coming out of what had developed in the Arabic world. A little bit of evidence for why and how I can justify those statements comes from the prologue to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. And you will be familiar with the story, I'm sure, a group of pilgrims going to Canterbury telling their stories. And in the prologue, a, a quick biography and a sketch of each of the pilgrims is given by Chaucer. And what he tells us about the doctor that was on the pilgrimage was that he was learned, well respected, and he could quote the writings of, amongst others, Discorides, Hippocrates, Galen, Avicenna, who I've mentioned during the course of this talk. So where does that leave us with an influence on today's medical practice? There are lots and lots of examples, and I'm very aware of time, so I'm just going to pull a couple that I'm going to talk about. So in terms of wound management, this description of leaving a wound open that was given to us by Celsus is very definitely something that we still do. We don't use the fibulae and the thread in the way that the Romans would have done, but we have a number of devices that allow a wound to remain open so that it will discharge and heal better as a result of having done that. And this is particularly useful when you get traumatic injuries to the lower leg, especially where the danger of repairing that wound too tightly as part of your first element of treatment is that you can get something called compartment syndrome. So we very definitely use the same sort of techniques that were described by Celsus. We also use honey as was commonly used in the ancient world. And we've only recently started doing this in the last 15 years or so. We've recognized that honey is very useful for treating certain types of difficult wound. It's antibacterial. It actually is something that will aid healing. And it's particularly used for complex wounds and things like 
leg ulcers and so on nowadays. And then, of course, the symbology of ancient healthcare is still with us today. So I mentioned the daughters of the god Aesculapius, Panacea and Hygieia. Their symbols are used commonly by pharmacies right across the world. And of course, Aesculapius himself, his staff and his serpent is included in many medical college devices and designs and on paramedics uniforms. And when it comes to the World Health Organization, right at the center of it, you will see the rod of Aesculapius. So we can say very much that the Roman influence on medicine is something that is still felt in today's medical practice. And it's something that is evident right across the modern world. Thank you very much indeed.